Thanks. Um, I mean, fascism is really all about gloom and doom. It's, it was one of the worst political catastrophes of the of the 20th century. It, effectively, it was what Tom Nairn called it, which is a nationalist disaster. That's how he described fascism, a nationalist disaster. Um, and therefore, I thought I might start with a joke just to relieve some of the tension. Um, I was referred to by Professor Paranjpe as a Trotskyite who confronted Prakash Karat in the 1970s and then the next year apparently the SFI lost the election because of this confrontation that we would have etc etc. First of all this is to personalize things too much. We had a group in JNU which represented the politics of the left opposition. The left opposition is a term which comes from Russia in the 1920s and 30s of those Marxists within the Bolshevik party who were opposed to emerging Stalinism and then to the later full-blown Stalinism. It was called collectively the left opposition. Trotsky was only one of the leaders of the left opposition and likewise in JNU in the 1970s we always thought collectively and worked collectively. It's not fair to isolate one person, Jairus Banaji, and then say that Trotskyite. Now I hate this term Trotskyite so my joke is the following. What is the difference between a Trotskyite and a Trotskyist? Well, a Trotskyite is someone who does the foxtrot while they're skiing. <laughs> okay? If anything, Trotskyist, fine. That's fine. I'm fine with Trotskyist. And already by the late 70s, we were debating issues about whether Trotskyism was a relevant category any longer in terms of politics in India and so on and so forth. We were way ahead of the mainstream left in terms of our debates, in terms of our style of functioning, in terms of our political culture, in terms of our orientation to the working class. We were working with Faridabad workers at the time. We were way ahead of the mainstream left. And of course the mainstream left tends to take the position that students should not approach the working class, should not work with the working class. That is for the parties to do. The parties have a privileged access to the working class. Students should not think in those terms. It was a position that, needless to say, none of us agreed with. We did work with the workers in Faridabad in 1973, 74, and 75. Now what I want to do is talk about fascism strictly in its historical context, and I will leave you to draw the kind of analogies and connections and overlaps that what I'm going to say suggests to you in terms of whether it resonates with our situation in India today. Okay? I'm going to leave that to you. For various reasons, whether you call them tactical or strategic, I do not propose to go into India today because uh, I have a plane to catch tomorrow morning. And, okay, and the three themes that I want to talk about, which I think, I think are key elements of the political culture of fascism, are as follows. The first is the constructed nature of nationalism. You can also call this general theme fascism and, and the myth of the nation. Okay? fascism and the myth of the nation. The second theme is associated with Wilhelm Reich, who was a psychoanalyst and had a major influence on post-war feminism. And Reich's thesis was that patriarchy and the authoritarian family are the mainstay of the state's power in a capitalist society. This formulation enables us to integrate feminism and revolutionary Marxism in a way in which they're not often seen as being integrated with each other. I'll repeat that because it's such an important formulation. Reich's thesis is that patriarchy and the authoritarian family are the mainstay of the state's power in a capitalist society. But, particularly so under fascism, okay, where this relationship between the two becomes externally overtly positive. And the third thesis I want to present to you by way of describing a third element of the culture of fascism is Sartre's conception of, it'll sound, it'll sound pretty dense, but his conception of manipulated seriality. And I'll explain later on what I mean by that. As the heart of fascist politics, if you ask what's, what's really the kernel of fascist politics, it's what he calls manipulated seriality. You need to understand this term seriality to understand the dynamics of politics in, in, the, in the capitalist state. So these are the three broad elements that I, I, I want to brief, briefly speak about. The first one, the constructed nature of nationalism or fascism and the myth of the nation is something that emerges very clearly from an essay that Arthur Rosenberg wrote in 19, 
1934. He published it in 1934 when he was in exile. He fled from Germany in 1933. And Rosenberg was a Reichstag deputy. That is to say, in Indian terms, he was a member of parliament, of the Lok Sabha. He was a member of the German Lok Sabha because they had a similar kind of political structure to ours, you know, federal as well as uh, central. He was a communist, not only a communist, he was on the left wing of the German Communist Party, of the KPD. So he was the head of what was called, not the head of it, but one of the leading figures in what was called the Berlin Left. Because the, the left wing of the German Communist Party was based largely in Berlin and they had a strong network among the workers there. And Karl Korsch, Karl Korsch, many of you may have heard of him, was also one of those members of the, of the, of the Berlin Left. And Rosenberg's essay, the very title of that essay shows you how original his contribution was to a left-wing understanding of fascism because it was called fascism as a mass movement. The Comintern didn't believe that fascism would last long. The Comintern didn't believe that Comintern, I mean the Communist International, did not believe that it had deep roots. The Comintern really saw fascism as some kind of conspiracy hatched by finance capital. Like, a collection of bankers, of German bankers, sit somewhere and they, and they conspire to make fascism happen. As if Hitler is somehow a puppet of finance capital. And as if the kind of mass appeal that the Nazi party generated in Germany in the late 20s and 1930s had no roots deeper than that of finance capital, which is a ridic ridiculous view because it is so reductive. It completely misses what is unique to these kinds of right-wing movements. So fascism as a mass movement was a direct challenge. The very title that Rosenberg gave his essay was a direct challenge to the Comintern's understanding of fascism. In other words, to the official Soviet line on fascism, which is that it'll, it's a kind of nightmare which is sweeping through Europe. It'll pass in a few years. It doesn't have deep roots and it has nothing to do with culture and with mass mobilization. What did Rosenberg argue? And there are interesting overlaps between these three elements that I'm talking about, between the three theses, Rosenberg, Reich, and Sartre, the three best thinkers of the left on the issue of fascism. There are interesting connections between the way they argued about fascism, uh, which, which I'll try and draw out a bit later. But Rosenberg, essentially the argument, the argument is, is as follows, that fascism only succeeds as a mass movement. So it might exist in a society politically, within the political spectrum, but it will remain marginal as long as it has not mobilized a mass base. And I said I'm not going to talk about India, but look at the watershed of the 1980s in India. India has a watershed. It's the 1980s. Pre-1980s, marginal. Post-1980s, massively important. Okay. So fascism only succeeds as a mass movement. That was his, one of his central arguments in the essay. Then the question becomes, how does fascism, how do right-wing movements construct a mass base? That is the vital question we have to try and understand, even in, in, in terms of our Indian context. And his answer was, it's a very interesting answer, that the ideology which people called fascist was already widespread in Europe by 1914. Now remember, the Nazi party wasn't formed till the early 1920s. And Hitler and the Nazis did not become important in German politics till the end of the 1920s when the economic crisis hit full blast. And so what is Rosenberg saying when he says that the ideology which we call fascist was already widespread in European society by 1914? He is reversing the relationship between politics and ideology. He is saying the ideology is not a creation of the political party. The political party is a creation of the ideology. Okay? So he's pointing to some slower moving process within European politics and European society which can be traced back to the 1870s and the 1880s. And what is that? That when, as and when parliamentary democracy begins to expand in Europe, the traditional elites of European society are faced with a dilemma. How do they win elections? I mean, these traditional elites have absolutely no appeal to the masses. Absolutely none. They represent the interests of big business and of landed property, of large landed property. Why on earth would they have any appeal to the masses? Because they are in fact the oppressors of the working people. But this is where this, the, the, the whole point about ideology becomes important because the kind of politics that emerged in Europe in the 1870s and 80s is what Rosenberg calls 
a new authoritarian conservatism. And it was there in Britain, it was there in the Habsburg Empire, it was there in Italy, in France, and in Germany. This new authoritarian conservatism is in some sense to be seen as the 19th century precursor of fascist ideology, of the fascisms that become more dominant later on. Now, fascist ideology is actually a pastiche of motifs. It's a pastiche of different ideological currents. It has very little coherence on its own. And the, it's important to say this because it means you have to try and look at the individual components of a fascist ideology. And these should be obvious to us by today. For example, racism. All right? Racism. Support for a strong state. Strong state externally acting on the world. They wanted German capital to become German imperialism so that it could compete effectively on the world market and so on. So support for imperialism for an aggressive external thrust. Hostility to labor. Incredible hostility to labor and to, organ and to the organized working class. Um, Authoritarianism, okay? Connected with that would be patriarchy. And the last and most important of these components of this kind of ideological pastiche that makes up fascism is nationalism, okay? The key to the success of the right wing in European politics from the 1870s onwards lies in the emergence of a new kind of nationalism which European politics did not know before the 1870s. All right, that kind of aggressive, xenophobic nationalism was not there on the European political scene in 1848. It wasn't there in the 1860s when Marx was writing Capital. It becomes dominant and much more aggressive, overtly aggressive, from the 1870s onwards. And that's partly linked to the rush for colonies, the, the, you know, the, the whole frantic rush to divide up Africa, to grab pieces of land and so on and so forth. But it's not only linked to that. Okay? I don't want to have a kind of economic, reductive explanation of, of nationalism itself. So let, what do I mean by the constructed, constructed nature of, uh, of, of nationalism? Um, or why, why call it fascism and the myth of the nation? Do nations exist? Simple question. Do nations exist in the way that classes exist? Let me ask you this. This is the most important question we face in India today. Do nations exist in the way that classes exist? I know what a class is when I see it. I live in, the, in a society which is a middle class society. I know what the middle class is in a, in, a, in a city like Bombay. And I know what kind of culture is epitomized by the middle class in India today. Okay, so I can see the middle class. I see its culture. I see its politics. And if I were living somewhere else, for example, in rural India, I would, I would, I would confront other classes. I know what the working class looks like. All right, I know where the working class is employed. And there are other working classes who are not employed in large-scale units of production. They're employed in the home and so on and so forth. But class, the point about class is that these are real communities. These are real existing entities. Who on earth would want to argue that a nation has the same kind of ontology as a class? That the nation exists in the same sense as a class exists? Okay? So, since nationalism is part of the is one of the kind of main themes in these lectures. Let me just sum up my position vis-a-vis -vis the two dominant interpretations or models on nationalism currently. The first is associated with Ernst Gellner, and Gellner's position was totally supported by Hobsbawm. The other position, which in some ways is more popular from the, from the kind of, uh, I don't know, 1980s or 1990s onwards, is, is uh, Imagine Communities, Benedict Anderson, Perry Anderson's well, not necessarily more intelligent brother, but <laughs> anyway, Barry Anderson's brother, his better half or whatever. Benedict Anderson describes the, the nation as an imagined community, but he wants to give a kind of positive spin to the word imagined, okay? And this is very, very much different from the way Gellner understood nations and nationalism. Can I have Let me just refer to this. Hobsbawm, on the constructed nature of nationalism, says this. With Gellner, I would stress the element of artifact, invention, and social engineering, which enters into the making of nations. And he quotes Gellner, quote, Nations as a natural, God-given way of classifying people as an inherent political destiny are a myth. That's why I, met, I, I said fascism and the, and the myth of the nation.
nationalism, which sometimes takes pre-existing cultures and turns them into nations, sometimes invents them, and often obliterates pre-existing cultures, that is a reality. So notice the dissymmetry here. Nations are a myth, nationalism is a reality. And then Hobsbawm, by way of agreeing with this, says, in short, for the purposes of analysis, nationalism comes before nations. Nations do not make states and nationalisms, but the other way round. Okay? That's the argument of Gellner and Hobsbawm, which I completely agree with. Nations do not make states and nationalisms, but the other way around. Now, in contrast to that, Anderson, Benedict Anderson says, Gellner makes a comparable point when he rules that nationalism is not the awakening of nations to self-consciousness. Why not? Because nations are not pre-existing. They don't pre-exist nationalism. It invents nations where they do not exist. The drawback to this formulation, says Anderson, is that Gellner is so anxious to show that nationalism masquerades under false pretenses that he assimilates invention to fabrication and to falsity rather than to imagining and creation. Now look at the dividing line here. One guy is saying nations are fabricated, nations are fabrications. The other guy is saying no, 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 not quite. They are imaginings. Okay. So Anderson prefers to put it like that, imagining and creation. In this way, he implies that true communities exist. He means, Anderson is talking about Gellner. Gellner implies that true communities exist, which can be advantageously juxtaposed to nations. What does Anderson have in mind? Very clearly, class. Okay, it's very clearly he has class in mind. Anderson doesn't agree with that. For him, class is as imagined a community as the nation is. Okay, and what does he mean by imagination? imagining? It is imagined as a community because the nation is always conceived as a deep horizontal comradeship. Amazing. The obvious question, the big elephant in the room here facing Anderson is, who does the imagining? Simple. Even if you suppose that nations are imagined communities, who on earth is doing the imagining? He hasn't answered, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, he hasn't answered that. And what sense can comradeship have with the kind of indefinite serialities that make up any country? What, what sense does it make to talk about a nation as a deep, horizontal comradeship? Okay? I can understand the class being conceived in those terms and discussed in those terms, but, but, not, but not a nation. Now, there's one more thinker I want to bring into the picture. Her name is Leah Greenfeld, and she wrote a book called Five Roads to Modernity, which examines nationalism in the context of France, Russia, Germany, etc., etc. She makes an interesting point, which has a direct bearing on India. She says, much more often a nation is defined not as a composite entity, that means made up of individuals, but as a collective individual. Oh, this is creepy. It reminds me of Arnab Goswami, okay? <laughs> a nation is a collective individual endowed with a will and an interest of its own, which are independent of and take priority over the wills and interests of human individuals within the nation. Those human individuals are you and I, real people, real entities, existential entities. We meet with each other, we talk to each other, and so on and so forth. But no, Arnab will have none of this. For him, the supreme individual, the only one that matters is the nation. The nation demands to know. <laughs> Arnab keeps screeching at us every evening. The nation demands to know, and so on and so forth. So what does Greenfeld say about this conception of nationalism? Collective, she calls it, such a definition of the nation results in collectivistic nationalism. Collectivistic nationalism. Good term for what we are up against in India today. Collectivistic nationalisms tend to be authoritarian and imply a fundamental inequality between who and who, between a small group of self-appointed interpreters of the will of the nation. Notice that phrase. A small group of self-appointed interpreters of the will of the nation, the leaders and the masses who have to adapt to the elite's interpretations. If you don't adapt, we'll bash you. <laughs> 
Okay? If you don't agree with this, we'll bash you. We are the interpreters of the, na of the national will, of the national good. We are the interpreters. We have appointed ourselves as interpreters. Very democratic. Extremely democratic. Okay? This collectivistic nationalism. As, as Greenfeld says, it is intrinsically authoritarian. So in India, in a sense, we are up against something similar to this. It's a collectivistic, authoritarian nationalism which is being pushed down our throats. That's one part of Rosenberg's argument, the argument about the myth of the nation. There is, a, there is another part which is worth drawing attention to. Remember he said that the ideology which is called fascist was already widespread by 1914? So in a sense, Nazism was a product of that ideology, not the other way around. Likewise, Mussolini's fascism was a product of that ideology. Ideology comes first. The political praxis and organization and so on flows from it. It's a product of that. But Rosenberg went on to make another important point. He said what was missing in 1914 was what was peculiar to modern fascism, which is the stormtrooper tactic, as he called it. So what's peculiar to modern fascism is, are the stormtroopers. I'll just pass this back to you. Now, we've had a lot of experience of stormtroopers recently, but I promise not to talk about India, so I, I'll leave it to you too. Stormtroopers. Now, the term basically comes from warfare. These are those elite squads that storm the trenches of the enemy. In trench warfare, which was the dominant method of warfare in the First World War, okay? I mean, if you've seen, if you've seen this brilliant film called The War Horse, I think it's called The War Horse. Uh, it's all about trench warfare, and it's one of the most bloodiest manual forms of warfare imaginable. True, they had already started having the aircraft and so on and so forth, but the bulk of the killing took place in the fields. And it took place across trenches and between trenches. And trench warfare was essentially about storming the trenches. Now transposed into politics, this is what the stormtrooper does. The left did not invent the concept of the stormtrooper, it was the right which invented it. The stormtroopers are those squads, in, in Italy they were literally called squadristi, squads, they formed squads. They helped the Italian landowners in the south to break strikes by sharecroppers, to break those strikes and to eliminate, to murder the leaders of the unions in the south. When the industrialists of the north saw what the stormtroopers were doing in the south, they invited them to the north because they were confronted by a working class insurgency. So they invited the stormtroopers to the north. So the important point is this that Rosenberg makes, and I want to quote from this book because it so accurately captures the political scenario of the last six weeks. I'll just take that book. This is what he says about the stormtroopers. He says the activities of the stormtroopers of the fascist type, the activities of stormtroopers of the fascist type are in complete violation of the laws. Legally, the stormtroopers should be tried and sentenced to prison. But in fact, nothing of the sort happens. Their conviction in the, court, in the courts is pure show. Either they do not serve their sentence or they are soon pardoned. In this way, the ruling class shows its stormtrooper heroes how grateful and sympathetic it is. Basically, the argument here is that fascism begins to flourish within a bourgeois democracy with the active complicity and the connivance of the state. Okay? We've experienced this recently in the, in the past six weeks. We've seen how certain entities of the state have reacted to events as they've unfolded. The complicity, the, the connivance of the state in allowing a free hand to the stormtroopers is a crucial part of the story of why fascist organizations do not simply disappear from the scene. They are covertly patronized by the existing state even when that state, formally speaking, represents a constitutional democracy such as, for example, the Weimar Republic in Germany. So, so much for Rosenberg. I think those two or three insights
are, are quite valuable. I'll just hand this back. Thanks. Now, I want to move to Reich. Entirely different level of mediation from Rosenberg's picture of nationalism is a historical one. All right? The kind of nationalism of the late 19th century is a remarkable precursor of the aggressive xenophobic nationalism, the anti-Semitic nationalism that emerges, re-emerges in the form of fascism, both in, in Italy and especially in Germany. Reich's thesis is that patriarchy and the authoritarian family are the mainstay of the state's power. And in a sense, Reich is not moving away from the theme of nationalism. He is addressing that theme because what he's suggesting is a mechanism which is quite interesting. And this is how I'd want to describe it to you. In writing The Mass Psychology of Fascism, Reich published The Mass Psychology of Fascism in 1933, before Rosenberg's brochure. Something he started to do in 1931, the problem that confronted Reich was, why do the working masses allow themselves to be mobilized into movements that are manifestly opposed to their economic interests. This is a riddle. Why, why do the working people allow themselves to be galvanized behind right-wing chariots? Why? It's a real riddle. Because those movements have nothing to offer to the working masses as working people. This riddle, Reich argued, could not be solved economically. So he rejected reductionism of any sort. He, he could, there was no economic solution to this riddle. There was no economic explanation for it. On the other hand, if the solution to the riddle lay in ideology, we would have to explain what this could mean, and that is what Reich set out to do by making the family central to the kind of subjectivity presupposed in fascism. Word subjectivity has come into the picture. There is a fascist subjectivity. There is a subjectivity presupposed in fascism and in the way it works. And the great themes that Reich develops in the mass psychology of fascism can be summed up in three vectors that run through the first two chapters of his book. There's an excellent translation of mass psychology by a guy called uh, uh, Theodore Wolff. Uh, it's available, easily available on the net. The published version of, that, of, of the translation by, by some American and so on is, is quite unreliable. It's very imprecise. It's a bad translation. The one on the net by Wolff is an extremely accurate and fine translation. And these are the themes that run through the early part of Reich's book. One, his conception of ideology as a material force. The grounding of ideology in the psychic structures molded by family, by tradition, and by a repressed and often brutalized sexuality. In other words, ideology has nothing to do with ideas. It is not some mental phenomenon, some spiritual phenomenon, some superstructural phenomenon. It is very much rooted in it's biopsychologically grounded in structures that are molded by the family, by tradition, I put tradition in quotes, and by a repressed and often brutalized sexuality. In other words, ideology is a material force, it's grounded in the family. Secondly, the second vector that runs through it is patriarchy as the mainstay of the state's power, I mentioned that. And thirdly, the resonance that Reich talks about between the authoritarian character structure molded in the family, of course, and the Führer ideology that underpins right-wing mass movements. Now, this Führer ideology, we've seen it... Sorry. The, we, I mean, the Führer ideology, we weren't familiar with this quite in the same form. I mean, Indira Gandhi in the 19, 1970s, 80s, was she a Führer? Not quite. She was an authoritarian leader, an authoritarian political figure. She was quite capable of imposing an emergency on the whole country. But what political leader can we think of in recent political experience in India that would strike us as coming close to the figure of a Führer? I am not going to mention names. I am not talking about India. <coughs> I'm talking about Italy and Germany. So this, <coughs> this Führer ideology, Führer, by the way, il duce in Italian, the leader and so on, a mass leader someone with a strong commanding will, with a massive chest and so on and so forth. <laughs> who is it that creates the Führer? Unfortunately, it's the people who support the Führer. The Führer would be nothing without those people. So that's what Reich is driving at, that, you know, there is a resonance between 
character structures of a certain type, namely authoritarian repressed character structures and the, and the Fuhrer, the structure of the Fuhrer. Okay? One creates the other. Again, there is a reversal of causality, a reversal of the direction in which the influence moves. Again, it is the mass that comes first, mass culture that comes first, politics that comes second. Politics, in some sense, is a reflection of that mass culture. So I won't say anything more about Reich. I think um, this whole idea, the, the, whole, the whole idea of the family as a factory of reactionary ideology, not all families, but traditional families, authoritarian families, patriarchal families, as, the, as a factory of reactionary ideology. Those are Reich's words. And the family is a battleground where the child will either survive as an independent individual later on in life or be permanently scarred by childhood, defeated on the battlefield of childhood, defeated in the family. There is a brilliant movie by, I forget the name of the director, but it's called From a German Life, and it's about a concentration camp commander. And it traces the biography of this concentration camp commander. The man ends up on an assembly line processing death in the concentration camps in the 1940s. So the director asks, how could such an individual be formed? What is the process that allows for such an individual to emerge? Biographically, existentially, how can someone end up manning concentration camps, working on assembly lines of death? So the film starts with childhood, and it's a violent childhood. It's a, it's a typically lower middle class, in fact, rural Prussian family in Prussia, extremely violent authority figure in the family, namely the father. Okay? Now, in, this is the first sense in which the child confronts the state in childhood. If you cannot stand up for your mother against your father, if you cannot resist the violence of your father, there is a definite sense in which you have already lost the battle. Okay? When you grow up, when you become an adult, you are not going to be able to survive battles of authority. You will worship your employer, you will worship the state, you will worship state authorities, and so on and so forth. And the mechanism involved is identification. Because it's a kind of compensation mechanism. You lost in childhood. You were marred by the experience of childhood. You have grown up now, you identify with authority. There you are, you've beaten them. All right, you identify with your employer, you identify with the state authorities, and so on and so forth. Now, carry this one step further into politics, into the realm of fascist politics, and you can see where the Fuhrer figure is coming from. And there is a brilliant passage in the mass psychology of fascism where Reich talks about the individuals who support the Fuhrer and worship the Fuhrer, okay, as people who are, you know, helpless in childhood. They're absolutely helpless. He stresses this helplessness. When they grow up, they seek compensation in this particular form. They lack any kind of independence of their own. They cannot think critically. They have been dominated emotionally. They have been scarred by childhood experiences, and so on and so forth. So think about this. Think about the importance of character structures, the kind of structures that are being molded in the family. And again, feminism has a major role to play. Again, it's one of those bridges between feminism and left politics. To talk about the family as the site of the first class struggle, so to speak. The first battle, the first battle with authority and so on and so forth. Now Sartre, finally Sartre. His conception of manipulated seriality as the heart of fascist politics. Sartre divides society. He agrees there are classes in society. He's not disputing that, he's not contesting that point. But he divides society into two sorts of entities. Those who are organized and those who are not organized. Very simple. It's a very simple sociology. If you're organized, you can do things. If you're not organized, you can't do a thing. And you have everything done to you. Please take this away as the main lesson of this, of this particular lecture. The division between the organized group and the non-organized, which he calls seriality. Because they are like a numerical series. You wait at a bus stop for a bus. You have no intrinsic connection with the other people who are waiting for the bus, except the bus itself. The bus is what unifies you. The bus is your external kind of unity. But otherwise you have no in internal relationship with the people who you're waiting, you're waiting for the bus with, right? So he takes the example of the bus queue, then he develops it further and further. The, the type of ensemble that we're talking about here is the series, or the more general term he uses, seriality. Now, what do groups do?
groups are the ones who rule in society. Who, who is ruled over? The people who aren't in groups. Okay? The people who form the vast mass of any society which is serialized, atomized, fragmented. They have no experience of power. They are completely inert in terms of their ability to do things. They can do things as individuals in the series. You can do things as individuals. You remain an individual. You have your freedom as an individual, but you cannot do anything collectively. So what is the state? The state for Sartre is an ensemble of all the dominant organized groups in society. That's what it is. We talk about the bureaucracy, we talk about the army, we talk about the police and so on and so forth. Have you ever thought about the kind of institutional reality of these entities? They are incredibly institutionalized. Okay? They are essentially part of a kind of machine. But the important point is that they all emerge out of organized groups. At one stage or another, they were organized groups, they developed into degraded groups, then they became institutions, full-fledged institutions. That is what the ruling class is, that is what the state apparatus is. It's the ensemble of all the organized groups dominating those who are not organized. That's why trade unions are so important for workers. If workers are not organized into unions, they are simply a seriality. They are a seriality of, of workers competing with each other. As soon as they organize into unions, that is their first experience of collective strength and collective power and solidarity. Because the union is an organized group, at least it has the capacity to resist other organized groups. Employers are extremely well organized. The state is extremely well organized. The media are extremely well organized. These are all powerful apparatuses of organized groups. The media is especially powerful today. So what does manipulated seriality mean? Well, this is Sartre's argument. Organized groups are constantly working serialities. He says working serialities, he means working on serialities, working on series, constantly. By a process which he calls extero conditioning. I think he takes that term from an American sociologist called Riesman in The Lonely Crowd. This book that Riesman published called The Lonely Crowd. So, exterior conditioning. In other words, you have organized groups, powerful organized groups who are constantly conditioning people who are not organized, people who are kind of, you know, they don't know each other. They're listening, they're watching the same TV programs, but not as organized groups, as series. They're consumers of the news. And they watch, um, they, they may listen to the radio, uh, etc. I won't say, I won't mention the program that they listen to, but they listen to the radio. They're all sitting there in little groups, but they're not organized groups. They're sitting there in little groups, but they're not organized. They're essentially seriality. So this process of domination of organized groups over series is the essential process by which rule occurs. When you say, how does the ruling class rule? It rules in this particular way. And so the series becomes worked matter. Sartre is, is reasoning in terms of the analogy of production. In production, the worker works on raw material. Now, when the worker works on raw material, that raw material becomes worked matter. It absorbs the energy, the labor, the imagination of the worker. It becomes something different from raw material. It, is be it becomes worked matter. That is what the series becomes in the hands of the organized groups. It becomes simply worked matter. Now, the key to this, to, I mean, the reason I, I emphasize this so much is that one of the ways in which this process of conditioning occurs is to create something that Sartre calls a climate. And what kind of climate are we talking about here? Climates of fear, political climates. These are, it's hard to gauge these things. It's not easy to study a climate. But there was this brilliant, uh, uh, Georges Lefebvre wrote this brilliant history of the great fear in the French Revolution. You know, the panic that seized large parts of France because of rumors. He analyzed those rumors, what kind of rumors and so on and so forth. But essentially that is the kind of thing Sartre has in mind. That cli the political climate doesn't fall from the sky, it's created. A climate is created. A climate of violence, a climate of fear, a climate where there is a propensity to pogroms, a propensity to lynchings, etc., etc. All of that is the work of organized groups. Again, I don't want to mention India, but it seems to me that explosions of violence that happen from time to time, whether it's 84, whether it's 2002, whether it's Kandamal and so on, those explosions of violence have nothing spontaneous about them. They are the work of organized groups 
working on serialities. That's the dialectic involved. The aspect of seriality makes it seem as if it's spontaneous because these people are not organized. It makes it look as if it's spontaneous. But in fact, it is the work of very careful, intricate planning. The violence is the work of intricate planning. The violence is the worked matter. The violence is the product of these organized groups wanting to create a climate of violence and fear and triggering, instigating explosions against others. So serialities destroy serialities. People who are unorganized destroy other people who are unorganized, when in fact, in terms of some class or economic interest, they're fairly close to each other. They are not that far apart from each other. But it's like one set of workers is destroying another set of workers and so on and so forth. So manipulated seriality, Sartre says, is the heart of fascist politics. And then he goes on to offer the example of the pogrom. And the pogrom for him is the sovereign group, the organized group, directing serialities in such a way that it's actually extracting actions, actions from series, which is hard to do because if they're not organized, how are they acting? See, I, I, I said that series can't do anything. They only have things done to them. But a pogrom is precisely that paradox. It's a series acting without any, you know, any kind of collective unity of its own, without any solidarity of its own. It's being manipulated from the outside to act. And some of those horrific pogroms that took place in India not so long ago involved people of 10 to 15,000. 10 to 15,000, my God, it's a, it's, a, it's a horrifying thought to think of them moving from village to village. But it was all carefully orchestrated, well planned, well executed. Basically, it's the activity of organized groups. That, that is the importance of Sartre's analysis in the critique of dialectical reason to understanding things like what a political climate is, a climate of violence. And in this country, we are today living in a climate of violence, which is why black-coated stormtroopers, you know, upholders of the law, can, you know, you have insulted my country, this, that, and the other, all that stuff. But the nation is a myth. The nation doesn't exist in that form. The nation is incarnated in these people. If they want to put it like that, they are the incarnations of the nation, fine, you can have it. They are the incarnations of the nation. This climate of violence has emerged in the last so many months and so on and so forth, and it's really dangerous for us. I wanted to go on to talk about other things and so on, but I think I'll leave it at that.